Which is better, Signal or Telegram? This story and more in this week's episode of ThreatWire. For the JavaScript viewers, two new vulnerabilities were found in the Next.js libraries, CVE 2024-34350 and CVE 2024-34351 have been assigned a high severity score of 7.5. The first vulnerability, CVE 2024-34350, is a response queue poisoning vulnerability. According to Portswigger, response queue poisoning is a powerful form of request smuggling attack that causes a front-end server to start mapping responses from the back-end to the wrong requests. In practice, this means that all users of the same front-end slash backend connection are persistently served responses that were intended for someone else, which to be very clear is not good. The other vulnerability, CVE 2024-34351, is a server-side request forgery vulnerability, meaning that attackers can abuse requests to access or update resources they don't have permissions to. According to an application security engineer at Vercel, CVE 2024-34350 comes about under the following. Inconsistent interpretation of a crafted HTTP request meant that requests are being treated as both a single request and two separate requests by Next.js, leading to desynchronized responses. This led to a response queue poisoning vulnerability in the affected Next.js versions. The security engineer disclosed the other CVE and that it was also found by the team at AssetNote. The SSRF vulnerability is able to happen when running a self-hosted Next.js server older than version 14.1.1, the server uses server actions, and the server action performs a redirect to a relative path that starts with a slash. The solution for resolving both issues is to update your Next.js versions to 14.1.1 at the minimum to resolve both CVEs. Researchers at the Leviathan Security Group identified a network technique that bypasses VPN encapsulation. They say it uses decloaking, the ability to force a user's traffic off the VPN tunnel. In this case, specifically using DHCP features, they're able to snoop targets traffic. The attack relies on DHCP option 121. In 2002, RFC 3442 introduced option 121, classless static routes and obsoleted option 33, which still should be supported depending on who you ask. Option 121 also allows administrators to add static routes to a client's routing table, but with classless ranges instead. There is no limit besides packet size to how many different routes can be installed at once. To work, targets and attackers must be on the same network. Essentially, the attacker will trick the target's VPN into thinking that they are their DHCP server. Attackers can snoop on traffic using forwarding rules on the malicious DHCP server to pass it through to a real gateway. Using option 121 to arbitrarily set the route, they're able to set a higher priority than those of the routes used by a VPN. This also leads to all of the target's network traffic being sent outside of the VPN's encrypted tunnel. This decloaking attack was given a CVE, and with the help of the EFF and CISA, they were able to alert over 50 vendors prior to public disclosure. Now, here's where the story gets a little bit interesting. After publishing, it's come out that this isn't necessarily novel. They even acknowledge that this isn't novel by crossing out the word that they use in the first paragraph of the publishing. In an update included, they came to learn that this research isn't new and has been published across the web as early as 2015 in a blog post about hardening OpenVPN for DEF CON. They do the update and say the purpose of this research was to test this technique against modern VPN providers to determine their vulnerability and to notify the wider public of this issue. This is not a story to shame researchers in any way. Instead, it's a story about how we are losing history and that we need to get more focused on the stories of the past in order to make sure we don't keep rediscovering the discovered. If anything, I recommend reading the article as it was a great summary about networking, VPNs, DHCP, and more. Passwordless authentication has been considered highly secure against phishing, session hijacking, and man-in-the-middle attacks. The FIDO2 standard developed by the FIDO Alliance uses public key cryptography and security keys for authentication. However, Recent research has uncovered a critical flaw that allows attackers to perform man-in-the-middle attacks and bypass FIDO2 authentication. 
Researchers from Silverfront discovered that attackers can intercept and manipulate authentication communications between the user and the relaying party. This flaw allows attackers to gain access to the user's private info and perform malicious activities such as removing registered FIDO2 devices. FIDO2 involves generating a public and private key pair with the public key sent to the relaying party for verification. During authentication, the browser communicates with the FIDO security key. If approved, the security key generates a signature using the private key verified by the relaying party. Researchers recommend implementing token binding, which binds security tokens to the TLS layer, preventing token theft and man-in-the-middle attacks. Application managers should enforce token binding on the FIDO2 authentication. Developers should also ensure session tokens are only used once and thoroughly validate the authentication process. Telegram is going up against Signal as the most secure messaging app. Recently, the Telegram founder, Pavel Durov, posted in his personal channel putting the team behind and the product of Signal on blast in an attempt to encourage FUD, or sphere uncertainty and doubt. It started off with the claim that Signal messages can actually be compromised. The US government spent $3 million to build Signal's encryption, and today the exact same encryption is implemented in WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Google Messages, and even Skype. It looks almost as if big tech in the US is not allowed to build its own encryption protocols that would be independent of government interference. An alarming number of important people I've spoken to remarked that their private signal messages had been exploited against them in US courts or media. But whenever somebody raises doubt about their encryption, Signal's typical response is, we are open source so anyone can verify that everything is all right. That, however, is a trick. These claims have not been verifiable yet. In response, the Signal president has come out expressing that Telegram's messages are compromised and routinely cooperates with governments. The security community has also stepped up and very loudly proclaimed how wrong the Telegram statements are, expressing that Signal has expressed inability to give chat logs when subpoenaed. Experts like Matthew Green, a literal professor of cryptography, quickly spoke out on the topic and the security and encryption of Signal and the weird decisions of the Telegram project. Signal inherently is end-to-end -end encrypted, while Telegram, you literally have to enable the secret chat option, which uses a home-ruled encryption scheme created by another founder of Telegram. Signal uses its eponymous protocol, which, as explained earlier, is used by many companies as their encryption protocol of choice and uses open source, verified hashes, agreement protocols, and so on. While Signal has 14 known CVEs, Telegram has 36 known CVEs. But how did this all start? In a tweeted response to a Signal Smear article, Elon Musk chimed in saying, there are known vulnerabilities with Signal that are not being addressed. Seems odd. This has been appended with a community note explaining that there is literally no evidence for this statement and that the lack of evidence is very easy to verify. This tweet has over 3,000 likes with a view count of 1.2 million, but at this rate, we can't tell if this is accurate, just like Elon's statement. And for context, I personally use Signal. Some of you are right, but many of you were wrong. As a reminder, every story that is included in ThreatWire is a real story. There are real sources. And many of you said that the CISA slash FBI developer warning was a fake story and written by AI. Sorry to let you know that that is a real story and it was written by me. The AI story written in last week's episode was actually the story about the GitLab vulnerability that was leading to account takeovers. Once again, there is an AI written story in this week's episode. Comment down below which story you think it was. As a reminder, it is a real story, it is real news, it was just written by AI. Also, I do see the feedback that many of you enjoyed the off-the-cuff insert for ThreatWire last week. I do have a lot of research and there's a lot of specific numbers and definitions and quotes that need to be included to make each ThreatWire story comprehensive. It just wouldn't be feasible to do each story off the cuff. But I do write ThreatWire each week live on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash ending with Ali. If you enjoyed the other kind of vibe, feel free to head over there and hang out. I code on a regular basis there, and this month is actually mod month, so I have a lot of challenges to do that my mods made for me. And I would love to see you there. P.S. I booked my tickets from DEF CON. Who's gonna be there? Also, 
It's so sweet that some of y'all are talking about that I look very pretty, but I just want to remind y'all that I am an MIT educated software engineer who does cybersecurity as a hobby and in her free time. But if you do want to pop over to my Instagram, I'm going to be starting to post more photos over there, including memes about tech and maybe some reels too, but I know y'all hate it. So hopefully they'll be funny. Thank you so much for watching ThreatWire for the week of May 13th, 2024. Don't forget to head over to patreon.com slash ThreatWire and support us over there. Thank you for helping keep this show ad free. If you want to find me online, I'm at Ending with Allie everywhere. Good luck, have fun, and don't get caught.